Well, thanks guys for watching this video. Please subscribe if you haven't already and be sure to click the bell so you'll get notifications for the follow-up videos and uh, give me a like and share with a friend. Thank you so much. Let's get started. Well, howdy. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, we are going to uh, do a little video here that of a project. I, I already started it and then I thought, hey, I should be recording this. This is a cute little project. Uh, and so... Uh, I'm, I'm planning on making, uh, well, I'm actually making uh, uh, a couple of art objects, night lights, uh, for uh, some friends of mine at church and for their kids. And, uh, but before we get into that, I, I, you know, I've been promising to start a video making uh, a glass UFO, a glass flying saucer. And, um, I've had a problem with that, and and one of the tools that I made that I improvised some years ago uh, to uh, do diameters and to be able to put miters on circles, uh, when I went to pull it out, uh, I've already got the glass, uh, I've already done the drawing, the designs, everything, but my tool, uh, it turns out, had rusted solid like a rock. And so I I thought, oh, well, great. And so I had to research materials to rebuild it. The idea is uh, I'm not going to rebuild it the way I did the first time because first time I improvised it and it worked and it worked good enough to just keep using it the way it was. However, with this larger diameter uh, object that we're going to be making, I had to rebuild the, the, the device, kind of reinvent it as it were, which didn't really changed it, it just changed its uh, capabilities. Now uh, I'm not limited to an eight, eight inch diameter, I can do up to 24 inches. And it's given me, uh, this new device has given me a lot of versatility. Uh, so anyway, but we'll, we'll talk about that later, but uh, getting on to the uh, uh, art object slash nightlight <clears throat> that I'm working on for my friends uh, or for my friend's kids, um, this is just, uh, to, uh, kind of busy myself while we seem to be a little on the stalled side with the virus and all of that, but I'm sure everybody's dealing with that in their own way and we pray that you're safe and, and all that. But anyway, um, let's look into where we are now on, on, uh, again, I'm going to call them night lights from, from now on because I, I don't know what else to call them. But anyway, let's take a look at that and see what's going on. And uh, then we'll go to the computer and I'll show you the finished designs, what I intend to make. And then we'll pick up on production where we left off. Okay, let's do that. All right. Like I said, I had begun this job not thinking about shooting a video of it, but then realizing that it, it's a great little project to start. Uh, we started off, I had these leftover pieces of glass from another project and these rectangles of starfire crystal. And so I needed the corners rounded. And so I, if I can get that thing up, I, uh, ground and polished, uh, the radius corner to satisfy the design. And I did that for both of these. And then I've started building, uh, a frame to hold it so the idea is this this will be the base or something like it and so those will get mounted there and then what we're going to do is we're going to put these uh leds inside here along the long edge and then the pieces will light up so when i carve this glass and the light hits it, it it'll really show up very nicely so anyway, that's what I've gotten. I've gotten so far, I, I my trusty table saw here, uh, cut my grooves and um, shaped my wood. This is poplar. And so the, the LEDs will go along that edge in there. And so I've got to sand all these out and uh, uh, get them ready for painting, prime it and all that. And that's uh, pretty much what's so anyway, coming up. I've got the reason everything is black is because 
I've got to make my film positives from this. But when I go to actually etch the glass, for instance, this one right here, I'm going to carve this name deeply. Now this graphic here is going to be etched lightly. So it'll be like one's in front of the other. Now as a black and white graphic, it's more muddled than anything else, but that gives you some idea of what the finished uh, idea I'm is. I'm going to use the blade uh, to, what I'm going to do is lower the blade and then I'm going to make a pass through here and that will put a very slight, you know, kind of curving action on there. And then I'm going to raise the blade up a little more. Do two of them, both ends, and then raise the blade up a little more. And by the time I'm done, I'll have a little circular cove that I can sand, smooth out, and then paint. So I think that's a neat little trick. I learned that from a friend of mine who did a lot of woodwork way back when. And uh, I'm going to try it now and see if I can pull this off. So anyway, um, let's get started. Okay, here we go. Okay, I've got to double check the height of the blade. I don't think I'm anywhere there yet, but well, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. Okay. Okay, I had my board turned over the wrong way, so I made a thing there that I'm going to have to fill in with putty. Shame on me. Anyway, you can kind of see that, uh, you know, you're starting to get a little bit of a curve. This isn't really a, a huge exploitation of this technique, but it'll have a curve on it. Okay, turn that back over. Okay. All right, you can see the little subtle cove that we made. Now we're going to do it to the long sides. And hopefully, I'll do it right the first time. Well, I fell into a trap that I didn't anticipate. And that is, as this arrow, as this area is getting narrower, it's rocking. And I was pushing and didn't realize I was pushing off of level. So, we're not matching up in the okay, corners well, here. what I've decided to do is uh, I went to my belt sander here and I decided to just grind the corners into a radius. Now what that did for me is the radius begins where this uh, corner occurs and that just almost sort of kind of barely excuses it being uh, sort of asymmetrical as it is but by the time we get it all, uh, you know, sanded, filled, and painted, it's going to look pretty. It'll look nice, and it'll provide stability for 
our little art piece. Okay, what we're going to do uh, here is because I plan to paint this wood, I want to get rid of the wood grain. And uh, I, I've, I've used wood putty a lot of times to fill in cracks or holes and things like that. But a fella taught me a trick one time. He said, take your, your wood filler, your wood putty, and dilute it with water until you get a thick, uh, kind of a sort of a pancake batter sort of consistency. And depending on what you're doing, you might make it a little thicker or a little thinner. And what, you're, what that's going to do is that water is going to be drawn into the grain. And then when you sand it, you know, with the fine sandpaper, you're going to get a nice, smooth finish when you paint it. And so I'm going to mix up some of that mixture and paint it on. And I don't know, maybe a little more. And paint it on the wood and let it dry. And uh, then when it dries, I'll sand it and it'll be ready for primer and all of that and hopefully we'll get a or get ourselves a, a nice finish but as you can imagine getting wood filler to thin out doesn't happen instantly you've got to really and I may have just put too much water in there yeah I may have overdone it who knows so now we've got this mixed up and I think it's just about just about as good as it's going to get. I'm not going to thicken it up anymore. Although, ideally, I would have added less water. Okay, so, make a mess. Let me go get a little brush, and we'll paint that on. Okay, when I'm through painting this on, I'm going to seal it and save it in case I have to do a second coat. I'm not guaranteed to need a second coat, but I suspect that we'll want it. So, we're just going to paint it in the whole surface, get it wet with it, let it dry, and then after we start to sand, we'll know if we need to do it a second time. Okay. So now we'll just set this down, let it dry, and uh, who knows, maybe I'll look out and not have to do a second application. Okay, we'll come back to this when it's dry. Oh yeah. Okay, well, anyway, here we've got uh, the putty that was thinned and painted on uh, to dry and so now we're gonna start sanding let's just start at this side we'll keep going okay All right, starting to take shape. Yes, sir. Let's paint. All right, here I'm gonna put these blocks underneath these guys so that uh, any paint that runs down doesn't stick to the paper. So this is just good old Krylon primer. I like Krylon. I like it a lot. I've used Krylon for many years, and I especially like their primer. Okay, let that dry. 
We'll sand it with some steel wool and then we'll throw our colors on. Okay, now that we've got these dry, uh, the primer, I'm gonna take some clean steel wool for it, go over it like that and oh so smooth, oh yes. This doesn't take long and it just produces a nice surface to paint on. And there we go. That was quick and easy. So, now, what do I need to do? I was trying to, oh yes. I've actually got to sand the primer off of this little area right here because I am going to glue a piece of wood to that later. So, I'm going to sand most of the primer off of this surface right here so that the glue has something to grab a hold of. That's probably enough. Show you later what we're going to glue there we're going to see we got a little cap right here well i can't put this cap on until the glass goes in because once that cap goes on glass can't come out so anyway i want the, the wood glue to be able to penetrate that that surface a little bit <clears throat> so anyway let's spray some paint okay, okay. Okay. film positive here so I've got to cut off a piece of photo resist so let's see how long is that it is 11 inches long so we need to cut off 11 inches off this roll correct side facing up and then I've got to take the printed side facing down on this film roll it up now I'm going to expose it to this UV light for one minute Start the spray unit, let that water start getting hot. All right, that just turned off. So now we're going to take it out of the exposure unit. 
set the film positive aside. And I've got to peel off this light coating, this light plastic coating here. And that will expose the film. Now I'm going to put it over here and wash it out. Okay. So now we start the washout. And this takes a few minutes. The design will start to reveal itself within a few seconds, but it'll take a little longer to actually wash it out. Almost done. Our thinnest line is the last thing to open up. Now, I've got to inspect it to make sure I actually got everything washed out. And it looks good. Looks good. So I'm going to go put this in the dryer and it will be drying. <sighs> Alright, so here's our glass, here's our stencil. First thing I need to do is clean this glass. Get that nice and clean, dust free, just to be on the safe side. Let me kind of wipe any debris this might have picked up. Now, I'm going to cut some of my backing paper away, leaving, it, leaving an area exposed where I can stick it down. But most of the area won't be sticky because the paper is still there. This way I kind of line myself up, make sure I'm happy. It feels pretty good, and then tack myself down. Now, that helps me to stay in place. Okay, now we're stuck, but we're not stuck good enough. Not stuck good enough, the detail could come flying up while we're blasting. So now I've got to burnish every square inch with this little burnishing tool. So that just takes a minute or so. this detail. And these skinny lines can blow out pretty easily. So I want everything to stay in place so I'm going to be extra careful. And then I'm going to burnish again over the letters just to be extra super careful. Now I've got to peel back the plastic layer that's holding all of this together. And sometimes that's tricky because it doesn't want to let go. And so you pick at it and you pick at it and just please let go. Let me find an exacto knife here. This may help. There we go. Sometimes it's hard to get it started. You have to be real patient. Okay, now the areas we are going to carve are exposed. And so there's still the tiniest 
film, but let me tell you that film just disintegrates the second you start. It's like I'm popping bubbles here. I don't know if the reflections are allowing you to see it. But anyway, <clears throat> so I'll mask the edges to protect them so I don't accidentally frost uh, the edges while I'm working on it. Now we're going to do the same right here with this piece. So my, my stencil's a little short, but it's okay as long as I register uh, uh, the sides and the bottom. The top, I'll just put some tape there and that will take care of that. I'll tell you, I have been doing this for a long time and I just never get tired of it. It's just so much fun. Now, these are ready to go in the booth and we will carve these details. The letters, it is my intention to carve them to a peak so that it looks like chiseled style, so that it actually comes to a point at these paces. The keys, I'm going to do what I call stage blasting. Everything gets pushed down the same and not as deep as the letters. I want the letters, the name, to distinguish itself itself above all of the other details. But I want this uh, these keys to have a little thickness to them. Uh, I don't want them to be surface etch only. So we'll have, uh, you know, kind of deep carve, slight carve, and then the spiral nebula in the background will be surface etch only. So we'll have three levels of uh, action there. And similarly with this one, we're going to carve the name the same way, different letter style, but we're going to carve it the same way. And, uh, and then the bird is going to have a little depth. And then the lotus blossoms in the background will be surface etch only. And uh, I could have put the bird on this stencil with this because they're separated. I could have done it, but I thought, no, let's keep background, the background, the foreground, the foreground, as far as my thinking goes. And uh, so that's it. So these guys will go in the booth tomorrow, and uh, we'll get them carved up, and then we'll set up for the second stencil. <laughs>
Well, here we are. I've got my second stencil on here. Let me flip these over. Here's the front with uh, the name and the keyboard uh, slightly carved and a little more deeply carved. And when we light it up, that you'll really see to what extent. Now, this little guy right here, same thing. Got the name carved. When it lights up, it'll really show. And then the stencil for the secondary detail. And we're just going to surface etch like the spiral nebula here and uh, the lotus blossoms here. We're just going to surface etch. Now I'm going to put just a little bit of depth, just a little bit in the bird, maybe the flowers. And, uh, and then the uh, etching will be done. Okay, now I have just finished peeling this one, and now I'm going to peel the next one. Getting that sticky tape off is usually very tedious, but it's worth it to get everything off so you can see what you did and how it turned out. So, we will piddle with the, the uh, masking tape on the edge here for a minute and then we can skip over to peeling the resist off a lot of times when you're uh, peeling your your photo resist stencil off it's very sticky and very uh, tedious to get it all off. Now if you know you're going to be doing some light blasting like for the secondary stencil we did some very light blasting, very low pressure. So what I did was I left the uh, stencil in the dryer a lot longer than otherwise I would have. Uh, if you let it over dry it can lose some of its stickiness and then you blow off while you're sandblasting. But if you're doing light pressure blasting and you over dry it, the stencil comes off more easily. It comes off more easily and it comes because it comes loose more easily. So you don't want to do that if you're uh, doing something where you know you're going to be pounding on it for a little bit. You uh, would rather spend more time stripping it off than have it come off while you're working. And we're almost done with this. 
this photoresist is practically a miracle product that just changed everything overnight. Uh, in the old days, we would send our artwork off to the photoresist people, and then they would create a film positive from that, make the stencil, and mail both of them back to you. The film positive they made, and the stencils that you asked for. And then if you're like working till midnight to finish a job, you've got a dozen trophies you're working on, and you're going to go put your last stencil on, and it falls on the floor, sticky side down, you were done. You weren't going to get the job done on time. You had to mail overnight the artwork or the film positive back to them, and then pay them to overnight the stencil back. It was terrible. But then all of a sudden, we had these, in-house stencil making kits and let me tell you that was so freeing it was just a wonderful change in the industry and of course everybody just jumped right on board so the guys that made photo resist soon didn't make it anymore but rather they made the stencil material and uh change their lives as well I guess but anyway you can see it's coming off fairly easily and without stretching too much that's because I over dried it because this is usually a very very tedious stage uh, you can soak it in water and that'll make it come loose more easily but in the long run not enough more easily to justify having uh, the room to have a big, you know, two or three inch deep vat where you could put 15 or 20 trophies in and let them all soak at the same time. Real easy to do it one at a time, but required an awful lot of space to do it in, a, in batches. So uh, I don't do it that way anymore. I don't take advantage of that dynamic. Okay. I just used my finger to rub off the remaining little bits and pieces, the little islands of resist. But this is a, a lovely, wonderful product, and, and I have just enjoyed doing trophies so much more since since they made that change. Now, let's see here. Have I got it all? Nope, not yet. Now, me smearing this around with my thumb also tends to smear a little bit of the adhesive. And uh, so, usually requires me going over with a paper towel to get all my smudges off. So, See, my glass cleaner's over here. There we go. So we'll just give this a once over. And there's always dust left on the edges. I'm going to clean that. And then there we have the second one. Now, I'm going to work on the base a little bit and we're going to, well, we're going to load these into the bases here real soon. And when I turn the lights on, you're going to go nuts. It's going to be beautiful. Just, you could carve nothing on a piece of glass. Just nothing. And uh, then put it in a lighted base, turn it on. It's like, ooh. So anyway, uh, let's see here. Let's get to that. Okay, what we're going to do now is prepare the bottoms of these to be able to set them, you know, on a piece of furniture without causing any problem. So I've got this sheet of self-adhesive felt that uh, I got from Hobby Lobby. And uh, so because this won't stick to the wood very well, I'm going to paint contact cement on it 
and then we'll have a very positive capture. Now I want to brush away because I don't want this to drip down the sides on my paint. So I'll start in the center a little bit and then as I kind of spread it out, thin it out, then I'll start brushing off the edge. And then it'll go right to the edge without uh, dripping down all over the place. So this won't take but a couple of minutes. I love contact cement. I have seen it used in some very harsh conditions. Uh, we used to, well, I say we, a uh, company I used to work at built glass racks for trucks, and they built the best ones around. And they would paint the contact cement on the, uh, their frame, and then on the rubber that was going to go on the frame, and then these things, these trucks with these glass racks on them would sit outside in the weather for years and they never came apart. And I was always real impressed by that, especially when you're painting it on rubber, it's a non-porous surface. And so anyway, uh, contact cement is, uh, is some pretty good stuff. And buy the original formula. Don't buy the fume-free whatever. Granted, it's safer and uh, less flammable, but holy cow, it, it just can't perform as good as the original formula. One time, my uh, stepdad and I, we were painting uh, painting some tabletops to put our, our fabric down that we use on our tables to keep from scratching the glass. And holy cow, by the time we were done, we were toasty. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we were seeing things that weren't there. We probably should have gone and gotten brain scans right then and there. But uh, we didn't. We took our chances. But yeah, you always, you always should be smart and wear the correct kind of respirator and things like that. But anyway, we'll give this about 10-15 minutes to dry and then we'll come out here and stick this on. All right, I think this is dry. So, what we're going to do, now normally I would trim this more closely, but I'm, I'm trying to be fast and not so efficient. So we're just going to peel this back, set it down, and then touch down, and then... Press it all along the edges, and that takes care of that. And then we're going to take our second one here. Now, <clears throat> at Hobby Lobby, they have two kinds of products like this. One of them is very soft and even maybe a little stretchy and it has a real good adhesive on it but it's so stretchy uh, whereas this uh, still has a pretty good adhesive but it's stiff and the fact that it's stiff means it's not going to stretch on you it's not going to gather up and create wrinkles the other one's a little bit hard to work with so anyway uh, the slightly lesser adhesive coupled with uh, uh, the contact cement, uh, you've got a good bond and it's not going to come off. And so, uh, oh, that's what I was looking for. There you go. So anyway, now I'm going to grab a brand new razor. Then I'm going to see if I can trim this well without somebody else's help. Well, this is a little tricky. It's not that big of a deal, but it is just a little cumbersome. 
Okay, I got these trimmed and uh, so anyway, now we've got felt on the bottom and so it'll, it's a nice and firm surface and soft to the touch, not going to scratch anything or hurt anything. So anyway, when we put the glass in here, I've got to put the lights in first. Let's see, I've got one of the lights right here. So anyway, this is our LED strip, and uh, it's got the, the button here, the switch. The interesting thing is this, this thing, it's more by touch, not pressure. You don't really feel any action. It's just you touch it, and it comes on, and you touch it, and it goes off. Self-adhesive, we'll stick it in uh, the rut there. And I might as well show you how it goes in. We've got a, let's see if you can see it there, got a little passageway there. And so anyway, we'll stick that in through there. And you can see that it, oops, I'm doing it backwards. Let's try this way. So anyway, this goes in here like that. And then it adheres to the back. And then the glass will go in. And then I'll glue this little cap. We have our cap here, but I couldn't have a cap installed on both places and then get the glass in. So the glass will be glued in on the bottom. It'll, so it'll be stuck, but just to finish it off so that the bottom looks like the top, we'll have this little piece right here go in there and there we go. What, before I do this, I'm gonna wipe down the glass one more time just to make sure I don't glue dirt in place. Wipe all the edges. Make sure there's no dirt or fingerprints to obscure the light in any way. Make sure the silicone will stick. Okay, set that down there gently. Now, we're going to Fill the nozzle up. Now we're just going to run a small bead, not a lot. Okay, that's that. So I'm going to set it down. We are in place. Uh, just make sure that I'm actually all the way down. Okay, that looks good. And our little black cap is going to fit right on there nicely. Okay, now this will be sitting and gluing in place and it's starting to look like something. When we get that second one glued in, I'm going to turn the lights on and show you what it looks like because it's going to look neat. Let me just clean this up real quick. Double clean it. Okay. Okay. Now, we'll run our silicone in there again. Okay. sit right in there that is gonna look great holy cow okay I'm gonna pause the camera for a second move these around and then we're gonna light them up okay here we are looking at the piece this is essentially a nightlight 
uh, made for a young man named Andrew, obviously. And uh, uh, so now we're going to turn the light on and see what it looks like when it's lit. So, that's pretty cool. I like it. Anyway, let me get the other one, set it up, and we'll take a nice look at it, too. Hey everybody, now we're going to switch gears back to the flying saucer made out of glass that I've been promising to do for weeks, maybe months, I'm not sure. I had a device I had concocted that uh, helped me to put beautiful even miters on circular pieces of glass. <clears throat> and that's what I was planning on doing the UFO with. And when I pulled it out, uh, from under this machine here <clears throat> to, you know, start to work on it, the thing had rusted solid. There was no fixing it. And after trying to save it, uh, I threw it away. I, I probably should have saved it so I could show it to you so you can see the before and after. That being the case, I had to build a new one. Now, that one I improvised together at the time. It worked well enough that I just kept using it. Well, <clears throat> this flying saucer is 24 inches in diameter, which is bigger than anything I've made before on that device. And the fact that I had to make it again meant that, okay, everything I learned from the first version, I am now going to implement to make a better version. And boy, is it better. A, everything on here is stainless steel, so it won't rust. Anything metal is stainless. And uh, uh, the only exception is a little piece of aluminum on it. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, the piece is made out of a three-quarter inch thick nylon. It's waterproof. Uh, I also designed it so that I can do up to a 24-inch diameter. And uh, we're going to take a quick look at this. Uh, now, right here, I'm going to show you, uh, well, you can't really see. I drilled and tapped two holes here, and that's how we attach this machine to this machine. Now, an interesting thing about this lap wheel, when I bought this thing years ago, I bought it secondhand from a fellow, and I really argued with myself over whether to spend that money. And oh, I'm glad I did, because these things are real pricey new. And I've been using it for decades now. And uh, I had to replace the bearing once. I didn't have to replace the motor, but I upgraded the motor once. So anyway, uh, this is the device that what used to be about this big is now... <clears throat> Let me pull these out of the way real quick. Is now this big. And the reason for that is, as I attach this to the machine, it can go up, 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 allowing for larger diameters. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to attach this right now and take a look at it. So, let me move the camera and maybe you can see better what I'm about to do. Okay, so I've got this turned around. So I think 
what we need to do is we need to go up to here. So I'm going to lift this up. Now it's kind of hard to do the first one. So let me get like that. And once that's on the, the second one is easier to do. So there's number one. Come over here. See what I'm doing. There we go. So anyway, I need to tighten this down. Now this is not the setting it's going to be set at when we start grinding for the UFO parts. But this is how it will be attached. So anyway, now we're attached. And I even have the option of putting clamps on at the bottom, but I don't think it's necessary right now. So anyway, hope you can see what's going on here. This bolt I'm removing locks it in the up position. Now, once that's off, this will pivot down like this. Now, come on, let's go. Almost there. Okay, now I screw this in here just to uh, keep it out of the way. Now, this crank goes onto a suction cup. Now, let me go get that suction cup so that you can see how this is going to work. Okay, now this suction cup, it's a six inch cup, and it's not typical in that it doesn't have a handle that goes across, it just comes straight out. And what's great about that is, let's see here, where, okay, they're already on here. I made uh, these nylon washers, quarter of an inch thick. So what I do, I've got my circular piece of glass. I put this dead center, so I have to measure to make sure it's dead center, and I pump the handle, and it locks onto that piece of glass. I mean, it really locks onto the piece of glass. Hey, what's up? So anyway... Now that this washer is in place, I pop this through one of these holes and the diameter of the glass, the size of the glass, coupled with the pitch that I want to put on the miter determines where this will be set up and down and where this will be set in and out. So anyway, I put that there, drop this down on top, and then I attach my crank handle. Oh, I need to loosen it. Okay, That's a, that would be a good idea. Okay. So, and again, I've got two options here. So like on the larger diameter, 24 inch, I put it in this hole right here. But anyway, then I crank it down. And it doesn't have to be all that tight. And then, whoops, look at there. Suction cup tried to get a hold of the steel there. So anyway, the glass is attached to this. And as I turn this, so this wheel is turning very quickly. And then I'm turning this at a steady rate. And it grinds against the grinding wheel. And uh, so anyway, and while I'm working, say like, okay, I want to change this. I put a rough disc on here, and we grind it down to shape. Then I need to smooth it out. Then I lift this up, and the glass just comes right up with it. And if I have to leave it there for any length of time, I can put this bolt in place. And it stays like that. So I do what I have to do over here. Come back, 
pull it out, drop it back down. And uh, I'll tell you, this is so interesting. I'm going to change the position here a little bit. So anyway, my glass is still attached. Now the one thing you don't want to do, you don't want to attach your glass and then expect to leave it there for a week. This thing will very subtly bleed and it'll let go of that piece of glass in a day or two. So you want to keep working on it until you're done with that stage. And in a worst case scenario, as this cup gets older and starts to bleed faster, anytime when the plunger is all the way in, it is stuck. But when, once it you see this red line, that means at that point you could lose your suction. So when you just go pop, pop it again, and then there it is. So anyway, that's how that works. And we'll see that in action on about seven or eight pieces of glass. And uh, hopefully everything will go well. So anyway, we are actually really going to start on the flying saucer now. After what, 20, 30 years? Okay, so that's the plan. And uh, hope you come back to see that. Thank you so much for watching.